Section 26 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Martin. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 26, Selection from Crichton, by William Harrison Ainsworth. William Harrison Ainsworth, 1805-1882 In the year 1881, at a commemorative dinner given to her native novelist by the city of Manchester, it was announced that the public library contained 250 volumes of his works, which passed through 7,660 hands annually, so that his stories were read at the rate of 20 volumes a day throughout the year. This exceptional prophet, who was thus not without honor in his own country, was the son of a prosperous attorney, and was himself destined to the bar. But he detested the law, and he loved letters, and before he was twenty he had helped to edit a paper, had written essays, a story, and a play, none of which, fortunately for him, survived and had gone to London ostensibly to read in a lawyer's office, and really to spin his web of fiction whenever opportunity offered. Chance connected the fortunes of young Ainsworth with periodical literature, where most of his early work appeared. His first important tale was Rookwood, published in 1834. This describes the fortunes of a family of Yorkshire gentry in the last century, but its real interest lies in an episode which includes certain experiences of the notorious highwayman Dick Turpin and his furious ride to outrun the hue and cry. Sporting England was enraptured with the dash and breathlessness of this adventure, and the novelist's fame was established. His second romance, Crichton, appeared in 1836. The hero of this tale is the brilliant Scottish gentleman whose handsome person, extraordinary scholarship, great accomplishments, courage, eloquence, subtlety, and achievement gained him the sobriquet of the admiral. The chief scenes were laid in Paris at the time of Catherine de Medici's rule and Henry the Third's reign, when the air was full of intrigue and conspiracy, and when religious quarrels were not more bitter and dangerous than political wrangles. The inscrutable king, the devout queen Louise of Lorraine, the scheming queen mother, and Marguerite of Valios, half-saint half profligate, a pearl of beauty and grace, Henry of Navarre, ready to buy his Paris with sword or mass, well-known great nobles, priests, astrologers, learned doctors, foreign potentates, ambassadors, pilgrims, and poisoners, pass before the reader's eye. The pictures of student life at a time when all the world swarmed to the great schools of Paris serve to explain the hero and the period. When, in 1839, Dickens resigned the editorship of Bentley's Miscellany, Ainsworth succeeded him. The new whip, wrote the old one afterward, having mounted the box, drove straight to Newgate. He there took to Jack Shepard and Crickshank the artist, and aided by that very vulgar but very wonderful draftsman, he made an effective story of the burglar's and housebreaker's life. Everybody read the story, and most persons cried out against so ignoble a hero, so mean a history, and so misdirected a literary energy. The author himself seems not to have been proud of the success which sold thousands of copies of an unworthy book, and placed a dramatic version of its vulgar adventures on the stage of eight theaters at once. He turned his back on this profitable field to produce, in rapid succession, Guy Fawkes, a tale of the famous gunpowder plot. The Tower of London, a story of the Princess Elizabeth, the reign of Queen Mary, and the melancholy episode of Lady Jane Grey's brief glory. Old St. Paul, a story of the time of Charles the Second, which contains the history of the plague and of the great fire. The Miser's Daughter. Windsor Castle, whose chief characters are Catherine of Argonne, Anne Boleyn, Cardinal Wolsey, and Henry the Eighth. St. James, a tale of the court of Queen Anne the Lancashire Witches, the Star Chamber, a historical story of the time of Charles I, the Constable of the Tower, the Lord Mayor of London, Cardinal Pole, which deals with the court and times of Philip and Mary, 
John Law, A Story of the Great Mississippi Bubble, Tower Hill, whose heroine is the luckless Catherine Howard, the Spanish Match, a story of the romantic pilgrimage of Prince Charles and Steenie Buckingham to Spain for the fruitless wooing of the Spanish princess, and at least ten other romances, many of them in three volumes, all appearing between 1840 and 1873. Two of these were published simultaneously, in serial form, and no year passed without its book, to the end of the novelist's long life. Whatever the twentieth century may say to Ainsworth historic romances, many of them have found high favor in the past. Concerning Crichton, so good a critic as Father Prout wrote, Indeed, I scarcely know any of the so-called historical novels of the frivolous generation which has altogether so graphically reproduced the spirit and character of the time as this daring and dashing portraiture of the young Scot and his contemporaries. The author of Waverley praised more than one of the romances, saying that they were written in his own vein. Even Magnin, the satirical, thought the novelist was doing excellent service to history in making Englishmen understand how full of comedy and tragedy were the old streets and the old buildings of London. And if Ainsworth the writer received some buffetings, Ainsworth the man seems to have been universally loved and approved. All the literary men of his time were his cordial friends. Scott wrote for him the bonnets of Bonnie Dundee and objected to being paid. Dickens was eager to serve him. Talford, Burham, Hood, Howitt, James, Gerald delighted in his society. At dinner parties and in country houses he was a favorite guest. Thus easy in circumstances, surrounded by affection, happy in the labor of his choice, passed the long life of the upright and kindly English gentleman who spent fifty industrious years in recording the annals of tragedy, wretchedness, and crime. The Students of Paris From Crichton Toward the close of Wednesday, the 4th of February, 1579, a vast assemblage of scholars was collected before the Gothic gateway of the ancient College of Nevers. So numerous was this concourse that it not merely blocked up the area in front of the renowned seminary in question, but extended far down the Rue de la Montagne Saint Genevieve, in which it is situated. Never had such a disorderly rout been brought together since the days of the uproar in 1557, when the predecessors of these turbulent students took up arms, marched in a body to the pre all clerics, sent fire to three houses in the vicinity, and slew a sergeant of the guard, who vainly endeavored to restrain their fury. Their last election of a rector, Monsieur Adrien d'Ambrose, Pater Eridotium, as he is described in his epitaph, when the same body congregated within the cloister of the Matherins, and thence proceeded in tumultuous array to the church of St. Louis, in the isle of the same name, had been nothing to it. Every scholastic hive sent forth its drones, Sorbonne and Montague, Cluny, Harcourt, the Four Nations, and a host of minor establishments, in all amounting to forty-two. Each added its swarms, and a pretty buzzing they created. The fair of St. Germain had only commenced the day before, but though its festivities were to continue until Palm Sunday, and though it was the constant resort of the scholars who committed during their days of carnival ten thousand excesses, it was now absolutely deserted. The Palm de Pin, the Castle, the Magdalene, and the Mule these capital caverns, celebrated in Pantagruel's conference with the Lamosan student, who had conferred upon them an immortality like that of our own hostel, the mermaid, were wholly neglected. The dice-box was laid aside for the nonce, and the well-used cards were thrust into the doublets of these thirsty tipplers of the schools. But not alone did the crowd consist of the brawler, the gambler, the bully, and the debauchee though these, it must be confessed, predominated. It was a grand medley of all sects and classes. The modest demeanor of the retiring, pale-browed student was contrasted with the ferocious aspect and reckless bearing of his immediate neighbor, whose appearance was little better than that of a bravo. The brave theologian and embryo ecclesiastic were placed in juxtaposition with the scoffing and licentious acolyte while the lawyer in posse and the lawbreaker in essay were numbered among a group whose pursuits were those of violence and fraud. 
Various as were the characters that composed it, not less diversified were the costumes of this heterogeneous assemblage. Subject to no particular regulations as to dress, or rather openly infracting them, if any such were attempted to be enforced, each scholar, to whatever college he belonged, attired himself in such garments as best suited his taste or his finances. Taking it altogether, the mob was neither remarkable for the fashion nor the cleanliness of the apparel of its members. From Rabilius we learn that the passion of play was so strongly implanted in the students of his day that they would frequently stake the points of their doublets at trick-track or trumadane, and but little improvement had taken place in their morals or manners some half-century afterward. The buckle at their girdle, the mantle on their shoulders, the shirt on their back often stood the hazard of the die, and hence it not infrequently happened that a rusty, poor point, and ragged chaucius were all the covering which the luckless dicers could enumerate, owing, no doubt, to the extreme rarity and penury of money in their pouches. Round or square caps, hoods and cloaks of black, gray, or other somber hue, were, however, the prevalent garb of the members of the university. But here and there might be seen some gayer specimen of the tribe, whose broad-brimmed, high-crowned felt hat and flaunting feather, whose puffed-out sleeves and exaggerated ruff, with starched plates of such amplitude that they had been not inappropriately named Plat de Saint-Jean-Baptiste, from the resemblance which the wearer's head bore to that of the saint, when deposited in the charger of the daughter of Herodias, were intended to ape the leading mode of the elegant court of their sovereign, Henri Troy. To such an extent that these insolent youngsters carried their license of imitation that certain of their members, fresh from the fair of St. Germain, and not wholly unacquainted with the hypocrites of the sutlers crowding its mart, were around their throats enormous collars of paper, cut in rivalry of the legitimate plates of muslin, and bore on their hands long hollow sticks from which they discharged peas and other missiles, in imitation of the sarbacans or pea-shooters then in vogue with the monarch and his favorites. Thus, fantastically tricked out, on that same day, nay, only a few hours before, and at the fair above mentioned, had these factious waits, with more merriment than discretion, ventured to exhibit themselves before the cortege of Henri, and to exclaim loud enough to reach the ears of royalty, A la frais un connaud de vue, a piece of pleasantry for which they subsequently paid to dear. Notwithstanding its shabby appearance in detail, the general effect of this scholastic rabble was striking and picturesque. The thick mustaches and pointed beards, with which the lips and chins of most of them were decorated, gave to their physiognomies a manly and determined air, fully borne out by their unrestrained carriage and deportment. To a man almost all were armed with a tough vinewood bludgeon, called in their language an estoc volant tipped and shod with steel, a weapon fully understood by them and rendered by their dexterity in the use of it formidable to their adversaries. Not a few carried at their girdles the short rapier so celebrated in their duels and brawls, or concealed within their bosom a ponard or a two-edged knife. The scholars of Paris have ever been a turbulent and ungovernable race, and at the period of which this history treats, and indeed long before, were little better than a licensed horde of robbers, consisting of a pack of idle and wayward youths drafted from all parts of Europe, as well as from the remoter provinces of their own nation. There was little in common between the mass of students and their brethren, excepting the fellowship resulting from the universal license in which all indulged. Hence their thousand combats among themselves, combats almost invariably attended with fatal consequences, and which the heads of the university found it impossible to check. Their own scanty resources, ecked out by what little they could derive from beggary or robbery, formed their chief subsistence, for many of them were positive mendicants, and were so denominated, and being possessed of a sanctuary within their own quarters, to which they could at convenience retire, they submitted to the constraint of no laws except those enforced within the jurisdiction of the university and hesitated at no means of enriching themselves at the expense of their neighbors. Hence the frequent warfare waged between them 
and the brethren of saint germain de prez whose monastic domains adjoined their territories and whose meadows were the constant battleground of their skirmishes according to dulaire presque toujours des theatres de tumulte de galantre de combat de duel de debauches et de sedition hence their sanguinary conflicts with the good citizens of paris to whom they were wholly obnoxious and who occasionally repaid their aggressions with interest in fourteen o seven two of their number convicted of assassination and robbery were condemned to the gibbet and the sentence was carried into execution but so great was the uproar occasioned in the university by this violation of its immunities that the provost of paris guillaume de tignonville was compelled to take down their bodies from montfaucon and see them honorably and ceremoniously interred this recognition of their rights only served to make matters worse and for a series of years the nuisance continued unabated it is not our purpose to record all the excesses of the university nor the means taken for their suppression vainly were the civil authorities arrayed against them vainly were bulls thundered from the vatican no amendment was effected the weed might be cut down, but was never entirely extirpated. Their feuds were transmitted from generation to generation, and their old bone of contention with the abbot of Saint-Germain, the pre au cleric was, after an uninterrupted strife for thirty years, submitted to the arbitration of the Pope, who very equitably refused to pronounce judgment in favor of either party. Such were the scholars of Paris in the sixteenth century such the character of the clamorous crew who besieged the portals of the college of navarre the object that summoned together this unruly multitude was it appears a desire on the part of the scholars to be present at a public controversy or learned disputation then occurring within the great hall of the college before which they were congregated and the disappointment caused by their finding the gates closed and all entrance denied to them occasioned their present disposition to riot it was in vain they were assured by the halberdiers stationed at the gates and who with crossed pikes strove to resist the onward pressure of the mob that the hall and court were already crammed to overflowing that there was not room even for the sole of the foot of a doctor of the facility and that their orders were positive and imperative that none beneath the degree of a bachelor or licentate should be admitted and that a group of martinets and newcomers could have no possible claim to admission in vain they were told this was no ordinary disputation no common controversy where all were alike entitled to license of ingress that the disputant was no undistinguished scholar whose renown did not extend beyond his own trifling sphere and whose opinions therefore few would care to hear and still fewer to opogon but a foreigner of high rank in high favor and fashion and not more remarkable for his extraordinary intellectual endowment than for his brilliant personal accomplishments in vain the trembling officials sought to cinch their arguments by stating that not alone did the conclave consist of the chief members of the university the senior doctors of theology medicine and law the professors of the humanities rhetoric and philosophy and all the various other dignitaries but that the debate was honored by the presence of M. Christ de Thau, first president of Parliament, by that of the learned Jacques Augustin, of the same name, by one of the secretaries of state and governor of Paris, M. René de Villequet, by the ambassadors of Elizabeth, Queen of England, and of Philip II, King of Spain, and several of their suit, by Abbe de Brantome, by M. Marion, the court physician, by Cosmo Ruggieri, the queen mother's astrologer by the renowned poets and mask writers matre rosnard bife and philippe desport by the well-known advocates of parliament monsieur etienne pasque but also and here came the gravamen of the objection to their admission by the two especial favorites of his majesty and leaders of affairs the seigneurs of joyeuse and d'epernon it was in vain the students were informed that for the preservation of strict decorum they had been commanded by the rector to make fast the gates no excuses would avail them the scholars were cogent reasoners and a show of staves soon brought their opponents to a nonplus in this line of argument they were perfectly aware of their ability to prove a major to the wall with them to the wall cried a hundred infuriated voices 
down with the harbour dares, down with the gates, down with the disputants, down with the rector himself, deny our privileges, to the wall with old Adrian d'Ambrose, exclude the disciples of the university from their own halls, curry favour with the court minions, hold a public controversy in private, down with him. We will issue a mandamus for a new election on the spot. Whereupon a deep groan resounded throughout the crowd. It was succeeded by a volley of fresh execrations from the rector, and an angry demonstration of bludgeons accompanied by a brisk shower of peas from the sarbacais. The officials turned pale, and calculated the chance of a broken neck in reversion, with that of a broken crown in immediate possession. The former being at least contingent appeared the milder alternative, and they might have been inclined to adopt it had not a further obstacle stood in their way. The gate was barred with inside, and the vergers and beetles who had the custody of the door though alarmed at the tumult withal, positively refused to unfasten it. Again the threats of the scholars were renewed, and further intimations of violence were exhibited. Again the peas rattled upon the hands and faces of the halberdiers, till their ears tingled with pain. "'Pray to us of the king's favorites,' cried one of the foremost of the scholars, a youth decorated with a paper collar. "'They may rule within the precincts of the Louvre, but not within the walls of the university.' Marre bleu, we hold them cheap enough. We need not the idle bark of these full-fed court lap-dogs. What to us is the bearer of a cup and ball? By the four evangelists we will have none of them here. Let the Gascon cadet d'Epernon reflect on the fate of Quais and Magaron, and let our gay joyeuse beware of the dog's death of St. Magrin. Place for better men, place for the schools, away with frills and sarbacans. "'What to us is a president of parliament, or a governor of the city?' shouted another of the same gentry. "'We care nothing for their ministration. We recognize them not, save in their own courts.' All their authority fell to the ground at the gate of the Rue Saint-Jacques, when they entered our dominions. We care for no parties. We are trimmers, and steer a middle course. We hold the Gassars as cheap as the Huguenots, and the brethren of the League weigh as little with us as the followers of Calvin.' Only our sovereign is Gregory the Thirteenth, pontiff of Rome. Away with the guise and the Bernays. Away with Henri of Navarre, if you please, cried a scholar of Harcourt, or Henri of Valius, if you list, but by all the saints, not with Henri of Lorraine. He is the fast friend of the true faith. No, no. Live the guise, live the holy union. Away with Elizabeth of England, cried a scholar of Cluny. What doth her representative here? Seeks he a spouse for her among our schools? She will have no great bargain, I own, if she bestows her royal hand upon our Duc d'Anjou. If you value your buff jerkin, I counsel you to say nothing slighting of the Queen of England in my hearing, returned a bluff, broad-shouldered fellow, raising his bludgeon after a menacing fashion. He was an Englishman belonging to the four nations, and had a huge bulldog at his heels. Away with Philip of Spain and his ambassador, cried a Bernardin. By the eyes of my mistress, cried a Spaniard belonging to the College of Narbonne, with huge mustaches curled halfway up his bronzed and insolent visage, and a slouched hat puffed over his brow. This may not pass muster. The representative of the King of Spain must be respected even by the academics of Lutetia. Which of you shall gain say me? Ha! What business has he here with this suite, on occasions like to the present? returned the Bernardin. Tete de this disputation is one that little concerns the interest of your politic king, and methinks Don Philippe or his representative has regard for little else than whatsoever advances his own interest. Your ambassador hath, I doubt not, some latent motive for his present attendance in our schools. Perchance, returned the Spaniard, we will discuss that point anon. "'And what doth the pander of the Sabrite within the dusty halls of learning?' ejaculated a scholar of Le Mans. "'What doth the jealous plated slayer of his wife and unborn child within the reach of free-spoken voices, and mayhap of well-directed blades? "'Methinks it were more prudent to tarry within the bowers of this harem than to hazard his perfumed person among us.' "'Well said,' rejoined the scholar of Cluny. "'Down with René de Viquet, although he be governor of Paris.' "'What title hath the Abbe de Brantome to a seat among us?' said the Squoin of Harcourt. "'Faith he hath a reputation for wit and scholarship and gallantry, but what is that to us? His place might now be filled by worthier men.' "'And what, in the devil's name, brings Cosmo Ruggeri thither?' asked the Bernardin. 
what doth the wrinkled old dealer in the black art hope to learn from us we are not given to alchemy and the occult sciences we practice no hidden mystery we brew no filatries we compound no slow poisons we vend no waxen images what doth he hear i say tis a scandal in the rector to permit his presence and what if he came under the safeguard and by the authority of his mistress catherine de medici shall we regard her passport down with the heathen abbey his abominations have been endured too long they smell rank in our nostrils think how he ensnared la mole think on his numberless victims who mix the infernal potion of charles the ninth let him answer that down with the infidel the jew the sorcerer the stake were too good for him down with ruggieri i say ay down with the accursed astrologer echoed the whole crew he has done abundant mischief in his time a day of reckoning has arrived hath he cast his own horoscope did he foresee his own fate ha ha and then the poets cried another member of the four nations a plague on all three would they were elsewhere in what does this disputation concern them pierre ronsard being an offshoot of the same college of navarre hath indubitably a claim upon our consideration but he is old and i marvel that his gout permitted him to hobble so far oh the mercenary old scribbler his late verses halt like himself yet he lowereth not the price of his masks besides which he has grown moral and unsays all his former good things mon dieu your superannuated bards ever recant the indiscretions of their nonage clement marot took to psalm writing in his old age as to baif his name will scarce outlast the scenery of his ballads his plays are out of fashion since the glossy arrived he deserves no place among us and philip desportes owes all his present preferment to the vicomte de joyeux however he is not altogether devoid of merit let him wear his bays so he trouble us not with his company room for the sophisters of narbonne i say to the dogs with poetry more bleu exclaimed another what are the sophisters of narbonne to the discretis of the sorbonne who will discuss you a position of cornelius a uh, lapide or a sentence of peter lombard as readily as you would a flask of hippocris or a slice of botargo i and cry transit to a thesis of aristotle though it be against rule what sayest thou capate continued he addressing his neighbour a scholar of montague whose modest grey capuchin procured for him this appellation are we then the men to be thus scurvily entreated i see not that your merits are greater than ours returned he of the capache though our boasting be less the followers of the lowly john sadonchant are as well able to maintain their tenets in controversy as those of robert de sorbonne and i see no reason why entrance should be denied us the honour of the university is at stake and all its strength should be mustered to assert it rightly spoken returned the bernardin and it were a lasting disgrace to our schools were the arrogant scot to carry off their laurels when so many who might have been found to lower his crest were allowed no share in their defence the contest is one that concerns us all alike we at least can arbitrate in case of need i care not for the honours of the university rejoined one of the ecosians or scotch college then existing in the rue de Armadier but i care much for the glory of my countrymen and i would gladly have witnessed the triumph of the disciples of rutherford and of the classic buchanan but if the arbitrament to which you would resort is to be that of voices merely i am glad the rector in his wisdom has thought fit to keep you without even though i myself be personally inconvenienced by it name a god what fine talking to us retorted the spaniard there is little chance of the triumph you predicate for your countrymen trust me we shall have to greet his departure from the debate with many hisses and few cheers and if we could penetrate through the plates of yon iron door and gaze into the cord it conceals from our view we should find that the loftiness of his pretensions has already been humbled and his arguments gravelled to think of comparing a poor student from the college of st andrew with the rudite doctors of the most rudite university in the world always excepting those of valencia and salamansa it needs all thy country's assurance to keep the blush of shame from mantling in thy cheeks the seminary you revile replied the scot haughtily has been the nursery of our scottish kings 
Nay, the youthful James Stewart pursued his studies under the same roof, beneath the same wise instruction, and at the self-same times as our noble and gifted James Crichton, whom you have falsely denominated an adventurer, but whose lineage is not less distinguished than his learning. His renown has preceded him hither, and he was not unknown to your doctors when he affixed his programme to these college walls. Hark, continued the speaker exultingly, and listen to yon evidence of his triumph. And as he spoke, a loud and continued clapping of hands proceeding from within was distinctly heard above the roar of the students. That may be at his defeat, muttered the Spaniard between his teeth. No such thing, said the Scot. I heard the name of Crichton mingled with the plaudits. And who may be this phoenix, this gargantua of intellect, who is to vanquish us all, as Panyard did Thomasat, the Englishman? asked the Sarbonist of the Scot. Who is he that is more philosophic than Pythagoras? Ha! Who is more studious than Carnandes? said the Bernardin. More versatile than Alcibiades? said Montague. More subtle than Averroes? cried Harcourt. More mystical than Plontus, said one of the four nations. More visionary than Artemidorus, said Cluny. More infallible than the Pope, said Lamont. And who pretends to dispute de omnis cabili, shouted the Spaniard. Et qualibet ante, added the Sobranist. Mine ears are stunned with your vociferations, replied the Scot. You ask me who James Crichton is, and yourselves give the response. You have mockingly said he is a Rava Abbas, a prodigy of written learning, and you have unintentionally spoken the truth. He is so. But I will tell you that of him of which you are wholly ignorant, or which you have designedly overlooked. His condition is that of a Scottish gentleman of high rank, like your Spanish grande. He need not doff his cap to kings. On either side hath he the best of blood in his veins. His mother was a steward, directly descended from that regal line. His father, who oweth the fair domains of Eliach and Cluny, was Lord Advocate to our bonny and luckless Mary, whom heaven has solemnized, and still holds his high office. Methinks the lairds of Crichton might have been heard of here. I'll bet they are well known to me, who, being an Oglevy of Balfour, have often heard tell of a certain contract or obligation whereby— Bastia, interrupted the Spaniard, heed not thine own affairs, worthy Scot. Tell us of this Crichton, ha! And if you lack further information respecting James Crichton's favor at the Louvre, his feats of arms, and the esteem in which he is held by all the dames of honor in attendance upon your queen mother, Catherine de Medici, and moreover, he added with somewhat of sarcasm, with her fair daughter, Marguerite de Valios, you will do well to address yourself to the king's buffoon, Matre Chicot, whom I see not far off. Few there are, methinks, who could in such short space have won so much favor or acquired such bright renown. Humph, muttered the Englishman, your Scotsmen stick by each other all the world over. This James Crichton may or may not be the hero he has vaunted, but I shall mistrust his praises from that quarter till I find their truth confirmed. He has, to be sure, acquired the character of a stout swordsman, said the Bernardin, to give the poor devil his due. He has not met with his match at the Salle des Armes, although he has crossed blades with the first in French, replied Oglevy. I have seen him at the Menage, said the Sorbonneist, go through his course of equitation, and being a not altogether unskillful horseman myself, I can report favorably of his performance. There is none among your youth can sit a steed like him, returned Oglevy, nor can any of the jousters carry off the ring with more certainty at the lists. I would fain hold my tongue, but you enforce me to speak in his praise. Body of Bacchus, exclaimed the Spaniard, half unsheathing the lengthy weapon that hung by his side, I will hold you a wager of ten rose nobles to as many silver reels of Spain, that with this staunch Toledo I will overcome your vaunted Crichton in close fight in any manner or practice of fence or degradation which he may appoint, sword and dagger or sword only, stripped to the girdle or armed to the teeth. By our Saint Trinidad, I will have satisfaction for the tumultuous affront he has put upon this very learned gymnasium to which I belong, and it would gladden me to clip the wings of this loud crowing cock or any of his dunghill crew, added he with a scornful gesture at the Scotsman. If that be all you seek, you shall not need to go far in your quest, returned Ogilvy. 
tarry till this controversy be ended, and if I match not your Spanish blade with a Scottish broadsword, and approve you as recant at heart, as you are boastful and injurious of speech, may St. Andrew for ever after withhold from me his protection. "'The devil!' exclaimed the Spaniard. "'Thy Scottish saint will little avail thee, since thou hast incurred my indignation. "'Betake thee, therefore, to thy paternosters, if thou hast grace withal to mutter them, "'for within the hour thou art assuredly food for the kites of the pre clerics sans ha. "'Look to thyself, vile braggart,' rejoined Ogilvy scornfully. "'I promise thee thou shalt need other intercession than thine own to purchase safety at my hands.' "'Courage, Master Ogilvy,' said the Englishman. "'Thou wilt do well to slit the ears of this Spanish swashbuckler. "'I warrant me he hides a craven spirit beneath that slashed poupant. "'Thou art the right man to make him eat his words. "'Be this Crichton what he may, he is at least thy countryman, "'and in part mine own. "'And as such I will uphold him,' said Ogilvy, "'against any odds.' "'Bravo, my valorous Don Diego Caravaggio,' said the Sorbonis, slapping the Spaniard on the shoulder and speaking in his ear. "'Shall these scurvy Scots carry all before them?' "'I warrant me no. We will make common cause against the holy beggarly nation. And in the meanwhile we entrust thee with this particular quarrel. See thou acquit thyself in it as beseemeth a descendant of the Sith. "'Account him already abased,' returned Carajava. By Peleu, I would the other were at his beck, that both might be transfixed at a blow. Ha! To return to the subject of difference, said the Sorbonis, who was too much delighted with the prospect of a duel to allow the quarrel a chance of subsiding, while it was in his power to fan the flame. To return to the difference, said he, aloud glancing at Ogilvy, it must be conceded that as a wassailer this Crichton is without a peer. None of us may presume to cope with him in the matter of the flask and the flagon, though we number among us some jolly toppers. Friar John, with the priestess of Bobak, was a washy biber compared with him. He worships at the shrines of other priestesses besides hers of Bakbak, if I be not wrongly informed, added Montague, who understood the drift of his companion. Else wherefore our rejoinder to his cartels, returned the Sorbonist. Do you not call to mind that beneath his arrogant defiance of our learned body, affixed to the walls of the Sorbonne, it was written, that he who would behold this miracle of learning must hide to the tavern or bordel? Was it not so, my Hildago? I have myself seen him at the tumultive tavern of the Falcon, returned Carajava, and at the Lupinarian haunts of the Champ de Gallard and the Val d'Armour. You understand me, ha? Huh? Ha, 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 carousal scholars! James Crichton is no Stoic. He is a disciple of Epicurus. Vel impellum impignit, vel impoculum. Ha, <laughs> ha! "'Tis said he hath dealings with the evil one,' observed the man of Harcourt with a mysterious air, "'and that, like Jean de Arc, he hath surrendered his soul for his temporal welfare. Hence his wondrous lure, hence his supernatural beauty and accomplishments, hence his power of fascinating the fair sense.' Hence his constant run of luck with the dice. Hence also his invulnerableness to the sword. Tis said also that he hath a familiar spirit who attends him in the semblance of a black dog, said Montague. Or that of a dwarf, like the sooty imp of Cosmo Ruggieri, said Harcourt. Is it not so? he asked, turning to the Scot. He lies in his throat who says so, cried Ogilvy, losing all patience. To one and all of you I breathe defiance, and there is not a brother in the college to which I belong who will not maintain my quarrel. A loud laugh of derision followed this sally, and ashamed of having justly exposed himself to ridicule by his idle and unworthy display of passion, the Scotsman held his peace and endeavored to turn a deaf ear to their taunts. The gates of the College of Navarre were suddenly thrown open, and a long, continued thunder of applause bursting from within announced the conclusion of the debate. That it had terminated in favor of Crichton could no longer be doubted, as his name formed the burden of all the plaudits with which the courts were ringing. All was excitement. There was a general movement. Oglevy could no longer restrain himself. Pushing forward by prodigious efforts, he secured himself a position at the portal. The first person who presented himself to his inquiring eyes was a gallant figure in a glittering steel corslet crossed by a silken sash who bore at his side a long sword with a magnificent handle, and upon his shoulder 
a lance of some six feet in length, headed with a long scarlet tassel, and brass half-moon pendant. "'Is not Crichton victorious?' asked Oglevy of Captain Larchant, for he it was. "'He hath acquitted himself to admiration,' replied the guardsman, who, contrary to the custom of such gentry, for captains of the guard had been fine gentlemen in all ages, did not appear to be displeased at this appeal to his courtesy. "'And the rector hath adjudged him all the honours that can be bestowed by the university.' "'Hurrah for old Scotland!' shouted Oglevy, throwing his bonnet in the air. "'I was sure it would be so. This is a day worth living for. "'Hic olum meminisse juvabit. "'Thou at least shalt have reason to remember it,' muttered Carvaja, who, being opposite to him, heard the exclamation. "'And he too, perchance,' he added, frowning gloomily and drawing his cloak over his shoulder." "'If the noble Crichton be compatriot of yours, you are in the right to be proud of him,' replied Captain Larchant, "'for the memory of his deeds of this day will live as long as learning shall be held in reverence. "'Never before hath such a marvellous display of universal erudition been heard within these schools. "'By my faith, I am absolutely wonder-stricken, and not I alone, but all. "'In proof of which I need only tell you that coupling his matchless scholarship with his extraordinary accomplishments, the professors, in their address to him at the close of the controversy, have bestowed upon him the epaulet of Admirable, an appellation by which he will ever after be distinguished. "'The Admirable Crichton,' echoed Oglevy, "'hear you that, a title adjudged to him by the whole conclave of the university. Hurrah! The Admirable Crichton!' "'Tis a name will find an echo in the heart of every true Scot. "'By St. Andrew, this is a proud day for us.' "'In the meantime,' said Larchant, smiling at Oglevy's exultations, "'and describing a circle with the point of his lance, "'I must trouble you to stand back, Monsieur Scholars, "'and leave free passage for the rector and his train. "'Archers advance, and may clear the way, "'and let the companions of the Baron de Pronon "'and the Vicomte de Joyeuse be summoned.' as well as the guard of His Excellency, Seigneur René de Velcret. Patience, messieurs, you will hear all particulars anon. So saying, he retired, and the men-at-arms, less complacent than their leaders, soon succeeded in forcing back the crowd. End of section 26 Recorded by J. Martin